It's time for ROTD Weekend. So our exchange student has headed back to France. We had a wonderful time. And now, technically, I am in Italy, except that I am pre-recording this. So as I'm speaking, I'm not in Italy. But as you listen, I am in Italy. But I wanted to take a minute today to tell you about some of the things that I cooked for the exchange student, the things that we had for dinner, because I actually think it went really well and made me realize that these choices might be good for other people who are having guests. So if you're having people over or people staying with you, these might be some really good options for things to serve. So our exchange student requested specifically barbecue. So on his first night, I did ribs. And I know I've told you about this before. The way I did them is just so perfect for entertaining. You actually pre-bake them low and slow. So you take the whole rack of ribs, season it up, and then this time I wrap them in foil for about an hour and they're at 300 degrees Fahrenheit in the oven. And then I unwrap them and left them in the oven for another hour and a half. And then I just transferred that whole pan to the fridge and they stayed there. We got back from the airport kind of late. It was like 7, 7.30 p.m. by the time we got back from the airport. And then I just quickly cut those ribs. They were fully cooked. I added some barbecue sauce and popped them on the grill just until they were warmed through and charred on the outside. While that was happening, I had some rice going. I'd made a salad earlier. So that ended up being a really, really great dinner for when you don't know when you're going to get home and you want to have something great, but you're not going to have to worry about it. You see what I mean? It was pretty much pre-done. And I could have actually pre-done a different side instead of the rice, and then that would have made it even better, right? Or like some garlic toast, something like that. So that was a really great choice, I thought. We did eat out the next night, and the night after that, I made the Zuppa Toscana recipe that I love, where I use farro, the grain, instead of potatoes. That has sausage meat, and it's creamy, and there's kale, and then the farro, of course. And I just think a nice, hearty soup is so comforting. You know, Esteban was with us away from home, away from his family, and, you know, soup is going to fix everything, right? So I loved that as an option. Also, it's not very difficult or very time-consuming to make, right? Then I'm going to tell you about two more things that I made while he was here. And this is really what made me think about talking about this with you guys, because they're just so perfect for entertaining. So the first was a ramen kind of dinner. So I literally just buy those cheap packs of ramen, not the cups, like not a noodle soup cup kind of thing, but the packets where it's those wiggly noodles kind of in a block. I throw out the seasoning packets and I put water in a pot. I add some soy sauce into there and some sesame oil into there and I bring it up to a simmer and then I cook the noodles in there, season it if necessary. I also added some sliced mushrooms and some spinach leaves while the noodles were cooking. And as you know, ramen noodles only take like three minutes to cook. So that was nothing. And then I just put out a whole bunch of toppings and everybody could have what they wanted. And since this was essentially a stranger to me before he got here, I don't know exactly what he's going to like or what he's going to feel like. And so this just let him kind of customize his meal, right? So there were sliced peppers, little julienned carrots. We did cucumbers in little sticks as well. Some diced avocado, cilantro, green onion, sesame seeds, and then there was sriracha, sweet chili sauce, and more soy sauce and sesame oil on the side. And so everybody just loaded up their plates. I gave everybody a bowl with the noodle soup in it, scooping up, oh, there was leftover pork meat from the ribs in that soup, actually. The leftover rib meat, I put that in the soup as well. So good in there. And then everybody could just load up their own, which was really, really great. Also comforting. It was soup again, right? But customizable. And then one night we did something very similar, but completely different flavor profile. We did steak burrito bowls. So I cooked up some skirt steak the way that I always do. I will link to that for you so you can get my skirt steak recipe and let that rest, sliced it up. And then I had all those other toppings put out again. So it was tomatoes and cucumbers chopped up this time, uh, green onions, avocado, bell peppers, cilantro, again, sour cream, salsa, shredded cheese, hot sauce, and some taco chips, tortilla chips to crunch over top. And again, he could just put what he wanted on there and I didn't have to worry about like, does everybody like the same things? The other nice thing about both of those dinners, the ramen and the steak bowl, is that I was able to prep the vegetables during the day and have them on plates in the fridge. And then it was just the protein that needed to be cooked, the rice, the noodles, that kind of thing, you see? So it really, really simplified things. And so that's great for strangers when you don't know what they 
they like, or for groups, if you're having a lot of people over, or even just a few people over, you don't have to worry about everybody's likes and dislikes because they can make it themselves. And I just set it out buffet style on the on the counter and everybody helps themselves to what they want. So I think it all went really, really well. I miss him. It was really nice having him here and I hope he enjoyed the food and I hope you got some ideas for what you can do when you have people over or just for weeknight dinners. And now it's time for me to get new ideas. I love this part of the show. We have our surprise recipe of the day. And this time I am talking with Beth Lee of omgyummy.com. So many good recipes. She's an amazing recipe developer. And Beth also has an amazing cookbook, the Essential Jewish Baking Cookbook, 50 Traditional Recipes for Every Occasion. So talented, so many great ideas. I cannot wait to hear what she has in store for us. Let's listen. Beth, welcome back. Hello, Christina. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me again. Oh, it's really, really nice to see you. Nice to talk with you again. Now, I would like to start, for anybody who didn't hear us talk before, can you tell me about the cookbook that you have out? I would love to talk to you about my cookbook. My first cookbook was the Essential Jewish Baking Cookbook, and it came out in August 2021. So right smack dab in the middle of the pandemic, I was writing a cookbook. And it's one of the best experiences. I'm so glad I did it. So it's, again, the Essential Jewish Baking Cookbook. So it's all about the recipes that you wish that you had from your grandmother and want to learn to bake or the recipes you want to pass on to your kids. Or you just want to learn because maybe you're living with a partner who is Jewish and you're not or vice versa and you want to teach somebody. But what's really wonderful about it and it taught me so much is that I I was raised as an Ashkenazic Jew, so an Eastern European Jew on the East Coast of this country. And we have a certain set of like baked goods that maybe I was used to growing up with, but there are a you know, large swath of other parts of the diaspora of Jews that make all kinds of other baked goods. And so the book includes baked goods from Sephardic background, which would be like North African, Spanish, Greek background, and also um, Mizrahi, so Middle Eastern or even into the Indian area. So I have pita bread in the book. I have um, malawak, which is this wonderful flatbread. I have bizcochos, which are Sephardic. I have barecas, which are Sephardic. And then I have, of course, challah bread. And there's babka, which is on the cover. So anyways, I, I love the book. It's still going really strong. It's now being distributed by Simon & Schuster mm. and is was bought by a company called Sourcebooks, which is associated with Random House. So it's a wonderful book, even if you're not Jewish. Some of my neighbors like one woman is of a Japanese American background, but it, it it motivated her to start baking. And she, the first thing she baked were these Sephardic rolls called Rastas and mm. she loved it. And it got her to pull out her stand mixer and start baking again. So I love seeing people make things from the book, whether they're Jewish or not Jewish and just get excited about getting in the kitchen and creating something wonderful and yummy to share with their family and friends. Well, that is so exciting. Congratulations. That's a really, really phenomenal. And I know it's doing really well. So congratulations for that. So it's the different kinds of Jewish baking from around the world. Is it divided into like the holidays that we'd be familiar with? Or is it seasonal? How is it organized? That's a great question. So it's actually organized more by type of baked good. And then within the context of each baked good, it will talk about like, is this something you'd make at Hanukkah? Is this something you'd make at Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year, which just passed. So there's a book, a section on like bread. There's a section on like filled pastries. Mm -hmm. There's a section on cakes and I think it's cakes and cookies. So it's organized more by type of baked good, which, uh, but I think when you look in the end index, you could find, you know, Passover, for example. Mm -hmm. So on Passover, you would not be cooking with flour that rises. So for example, for Passover, there's this cake. Actually, I just demonstrated this cake at a live event and I encourage people. uh, It's because it's now on my blog too. Occasionally I will share something from the book maybe with a little twist. 
but it's a, I call it a honey almond cake on the blog, but it's in the book, it's called Tish Pishti. It's a very traditional, but within that tradition, lots of variations of, of a cake that is more of a Sephardic background. And it always has um, some kind of nut in it, always has some kind of citrus, but it could have different kinds of flour. I went the direction of using almond flour in it so that it could be gluten-free um, it happens to be dairy free because I make it with olive oil and it's okay for Passover because it doesn't, the, the rising agent, the leavening agent is egg white. Oh. So there's, there's no baking powder in it. There's no regular flour in it. So there's so many things about the cake that make it really flexible and wonderful for people of any kind of dietary, you know, observations that they have, whether they're gluten free, whether they're dairy free, um, whether they keep kosher and it's great for the holidays, like for Rosh Hashanah, because I use honey in the syrup, I suggest using honey in the syrup instead of sugar. It's great for Passover. And it's great for anyone. It's really just a fun, fun, you know, great cake. So anyhow, you can look in the index, you can find the recipes for the different types of holidays, but it's really more about the type of baked good, Mm -hmm. um, which I think makes it really wonderful for anyone who loves to bake. There's also a section up front, which is kind of a tutorial on like how to get your kitchen set up for baking and talks about, you know, like ways I try to organize my kitchen type the minimum types of equipment you have to have in your kitchen. And I try to keep it really simple. The ingredients in the book are really simple things you can go to your local grocery store and find Mm -hmm. Um, not something that you need to go to a lot of specialty stores or have super specialized kind of equipment in your kitchen. The whole idea of the book was to make it really accessible for people also at any level of baking. So a beginner to an advanced baker will find recipes to fit their level. And I've gotten great feedback from people. Uh, Even the recipes that don't have pictures are really very organized and you can really follow through and get, you know, through the recipe, whether you are familiar or not, that the instructions really carry people through. I try to hope, I hope that people feel like I'm standing on their shoulder in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah. Your voice is in there and, and you're you're being careful with the explanation so nobody's ever in doubt. I really, I love, I love recipes like that. So Beth, that came out in 2021, which is a couple of years ago. Yeah. Do you have yeah, no, I can't believe. Yeah. Uh, any more books in the work? What have you been doing? Well, I've been really busy working on my blog, omgyummy.com. So that's, that's been because while I was writing that book, I kind of let that step, mm. step to the side. So I've been really busy working on my blog. I've also been doing a lot of live streaming um, on a platform called Kitsch and just or, or on Instagram because I love connecting with people. Uh, one-on-one or in a group, in person, whatever. But I'm also loved writing the book. So I have been working on a new proposal with a friend of mine um, who also happens to be kind of my co, I'll call her my co-conspirator on my Middle Eastern cooking group that you can find on Facebook called Tasting Jerusalem. But we have a really interesting story. We separately fell in love with Middle Eastern ingredients, but we have been friends since sixth grade. Um, So for a really long time, Um, and our lives took really different paths. She lived in different places. We still live in different places. I'm in Northern California. She's in Southern California. But our paths came back together when the Jerusalem cookbook came out back in late 2012. And we decided to start running this group. And we Both had, as I said, separately fallen in love with Middle Eastern ingredients, and we took this perspective of learning about what everyone was loving in the Jerusalem cookbook, but learning it through the idea of the ingredients, because a lot of people were intimidated by ingredients in the recipes they weren't familiar with. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we've expanded beyond that cookbook. We talk about different cuisines, different cookbooks, but we always take a perspective of the ingredient, the ingredients that we love, preserved lemons, pomegranate molasses, baharat, like what are they? Can you make them yourself? Where can you buy them? 
And so Serene and I have kind of realized that in a way we, Serene Wallace is my um, person. You can find her on Instagram at fringe.food. So we are working on a book that incorporates this idea of this love of Middle Eastern ingredients, but also our friendship and our backgrounds as being people who live in California and love the California food lifestyle of fresh food and how that works together with Middle Eastern ingredients. So I can't say more than that because we're still in the process of selling the book, but it's very, very exciting. And it's very exciting to do it with someone else. It's a really wonderful experience. And I think we have something very special to share with people. In the meantime, if you love learning about new ingredients, please come join us on Facebook in the group called Tasting Jerusalem. And we're in there all the time. And it's a group so anybody can post. So we get this great opportunity to hear from people throughout the world. Like I just posted something the other day about this weird citrus that I got from a friend, a neighbor who lives right down the road, and they don't even know what it is. They think it's something like a citrone, which is like an original citrus from way back when, but crossed with something else. But it was really cool because I, I showed pictures of it and I asked the group, does anyone, has anyone seen this? Do they know what it is? And of course I preserved it, like, because I have to do that. I had to see what would happen if I preserved it. But anyhow, this woman commented about this particular citrus they have in Africa. I think she was from Nigeria. I might be remembering wrong. I mean, that is just so cool. So cool to be able to share that and learn from people all over the world. So if you're as like geeky as I am about learning about ingredients and cuisines and what people are cooking and eating and wondering about in other parts of the world, come and join us at Tasting Jerusalem. But the book, so the book is kind of like the book that Serene and I suddenly realized we've been kind of writing for the last 10 years that we've been running this group. And mm. we're very excited about it. Congratulations, but also it just sounds beautiful. It sounds exciting and beautiful, fulfilling and um Best of luck getting that published. I, Thank you. I'm, I'm sure you will have success given the group success and your previous book success. Publishers would be crazy not to pick it up. They're going to be fighting over it, right? <laughs> well, thank you, Christine. It's nice to have that support. And we, we hope that that is it because we know that what we are cooking up in the book is going to be something that is really going to make just just add some excitement to people in the kitchen without without making them stressed without you know like making just broadening their view and the fla the flavors that they can find with these wonderful ingredients but in a way that's super approachable so we're we're excited we hope we can get it out there to everybody and share our enthusiasm yeah. with them so great so okay now it is time I want to know have you prepared a recipe to, or, or planned a recipe to tell me about? I have. Okay. <laughs> um, and I, I hope you love it as much as I do. So it is a, I call it on the blog. It's, it's available on my blog. I call it a lemony seared flank steak with pomegranate molasses. Oh my gosh. Uh, it, it's really simple. It's deceptively simple. So you basically are going to be grilling or pan searing, could even broil uh, a flank steak. Now it could be more than, it could be something else. It could be a different cut of beef. It could be lamb chops. We can get into that, but you're really just preparing it and grilling or searing it. And then when it's all done, you're using one of my favorite ingredients in the entire world. You take your steak out, which could cook as quickly as three minutes aside, stick it on your cutting board, take some pomegranate molasses. Let me repeat that. Pomegranate molasses. For anyone who's listening who is not already have, does not already have this in their pantry, or if you start following me at OMG Yummy pretty much everywhere, you'll see that I'm kind of a freak about pomegranate molasses <laughs> because it is so delicious. It goes with so many things. It's so easy to make or you can buy it. You pour some of that on as soon as you take it out of your grill pan or off the grill or under the broiler, stick it on your uh, cutting board, 
put the pomegranate molasses on and then loosely cover it with foil. And it basically just creates this gravy, this delicious gravy. And uh, you wait like 10 minutes because you got to wait anyways, right? You Mm got to let your meat rest. So the juices stay in. So then you can imagine you cut this, slice this up, it's perfectly cooked. And now the juices from inside mixed with the juices of the pomegranate molasses, and you basically have this fabulously soft, automatically soft, let's say, cut of meat to serve. And you could make this just as easily in the middle of the week. I mean, seriously, if you get a piece like I, you can obviously use whatever size blank you have, but blank is oftentimes available about one pound pieces, maybe one and a half. So it cooks up literally like in a hot cast iron pan, for, cast iron pan, for example, you could be about three, four minutes aside to mm-hmm. a med- to medium rare, take it off, put the pomegranate molasses on, cover it up, finish making your sides, could be a salad, could be a roasted vegetable, whatever you like. Maybe you've already made like a pot of rice, some roasted potatoes. And then 10 minutes later, this is ready. And it's just, it's so good. And then I can tell you, like, I served this on the weekend. Uh, For example, we were up with friends and we had, I don't know, eight people or something to serve for a dinner on a Saturday night. And we had like, um, we had lamb chops and a lot of lamb chops. I mean, because we were like eight people and a couple of people were like young men who eat, could eat, you know four or five of them, right? But you just treat the meat with like some olive oil, salt, pepper, and I like to put a little lemon juice on it. That's it. And then all of those went on the grill. And when they came off, we did the same thing. We put the pomegranate molasses on. And then 10 minutes later, we served them up and there was not a lamb chop left. I mean, it was just absolutely delicious, but really, could it be easier? No. I mean, you got it. You, you always prep your meat with something, right? So in this case, it's just olive oil, salt, pepper, and some lemon juice. Grill it up, put the pomegranate molasses on. And then you can kind of play like you could go with the whole theme of the pomegranate. So so while we're talking right now, my I have a pomegranate tree and pomegranates mm-hmm. are exactly ripe right now. So you could totally play with this and you could serve you know, a salad on the side with fresh pomegranate arrows on it, you know, arrows mm-hmm. are the pomegranate seeds. So you could really make a whole theme mm-hmm. around mm-hmm. the pomegranate and the pomegranate molasses. But pomegranate molasses, you can have all year round. You don't have to have the fresh pomegranate. You can make your own pomegranate juice from the pomegranate seeds and then reduce it down and make your pomegranate molasses. Absolutely. But you can also go to the store and buy a jar of pomegranate juice, just unadulterated pomegranate juice. It's available. You don't have to go to a special store. You can find it in Safeway. They'll have a jar of pomegranate juice. Mm -hmm. You take two cups of it, or if you want to make a little more, four cups of it. I put it on a pot on the stove and slowly reduce it down till it gets to where it's coating the back of a spoon. And voila, you have Mm -hmm. pomegranate molasses. It's that simple. Amazing. It's really, really that simple. Now, but you can buy it. If you don't want to make pomegranate molasses, you can buy it. Um, you probably have to find a like a specialized Middle Eastern store or order it online. It's totally available, but it's so make it yourself. I have never made it myself and I'm kicking myself because I've bought it many times, but I've never even thought to make it myself. So that I'm going to add pomegranate juice to my grocery list as soon as we're done talking and I will try that. I have questions for you. So some of them are about the pomegranate treatment, but some are other things. When you are grilling your flight steak, do you take it out of the fridge and have it at room temperature for a little while or do you go straight to the grill or pan with it? I think everybody's different about this. Yeah, you know, I've started reading uh, arguments to the contrary that you don't want your meat to come to room temperature. And I don't know, where do you stand on this? I generally do have it out because I will also like to just, just because it it maybe does a little bit of tenderizing since Mm. I put the lemon juice on it ahead of time. So I usually have it, I'll take it out maybe half an hour before, put it on, you know, a cut, a cutting board or a plate, put the lemon juice, olive oil, salt, pepper on, maybe let it sit for a bit. Like I say, I've been reading more and more that people are saying, don't do that. Don't let it come to room temperature. I would say that I'm probably halfway between fridge temperature, room temperature, and I'm really more taking it out 
it's almost like a little marinating. Right, right. That makes, and it's going to marinate faster if it's at room temperature than if it's in, in the fridge like that. So I'll, I'll, where I am on this and people get upset with me, but it is true. There are people in my house who like well done steak. And if you want well done steak, then I definitely do room temperature because it's going to cook faster and not risk kind of burning on the outside as, as badly when you're trying to get it up to that temperature. But if I'm trying to do like medium rare, I usually go fridge so that, so this, I learned this from the splendid table listening to Lynn Rosetto Casper. So that's who I heard this from. She said, when you want a rarer steak, you want it to have contact with the pan for as long as possible even though you're not cooking it for as long so that you can get that crust and so if it's cold it's going to take longer to get to the temperature you want so you get more time i haven't tested it on the outside right i haven't tested the side by side but it makes so much sense it does and my husband is kind of the steak maker in the house not so much this particular recipe although he would but he kind of he loves just like a your regular old like good you know like a rib steak or whatever and he plays around like he'll salt it and leave it open in the fridge for like two days yeah. and then we we're always trying to get that best crust on it mm-hmm. and we personally like medium rare steak mm-hmm. so it does make logical sense to me that if it's colder that it's not going to cook in the inside as fast and you're going to get that really good crust on the outside there is a video on my in the blog post for this that uh, shows me putting the flank steak in a super hot cast iron pan and you can see the smoke coming up i love i love watching that little clip Mm -hmm. some professional video people helped me with that but so really that really hot pan too really Mm helps like putting Mm -hmm. it in a super hot pan and that's why like the instructions on this recipe for a, like a one pound flank steak and flank steaks, if you're not familiar with them or for anyone listening, they're usually fairly thin um, and you have to be so careful about cutting it across the grain. Mm-hmm. It'll be mm-hmm. super tender and delicious if you do, not if you don't. Mm-hmm. Um, but it literally did only take me like three minutes aside. And then, you know, reminding people, which I'm sure you, I've heard you do as well on your podcast that you don't want to take it off already at the temperature you want, because while it sits in rest, mm-hmm. it's going to go higher. And we we have this thermometer we use now to, to track the temperature and we watch it. You know, we it's really true. Like it's hard for people to believe, but it's really, really true that it goes up in temperature after you take it out. Oh, yeah. so you want to pick about five to 10 degrees less temperature than where you want to end up. And I have cooked this appropriately to medium rare with three minutes aside in a really hot pan. I love that. I I will say the thermometer thing, like I have this probe thermometer with like a digital reader on it. And I I have some TikTok videos where I'm using that to do different steaks or things. And I get these, yeah, people are trolling on TikTok. You know, they are, but they're like, Mm -hmm. who (laughs) needs a thermometer to know where their steak is done? What, why, what kind of expert are you like this kind of thing? And I'm like, Oh, no, Mm -hmm. no. Like, this is perfect. Like, this is coming out. Like, I I do it on the stove and then transfer it to the oven or whatever I'm doing. It is exactly the right temperature. And it makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. Oh, totally. It it really does. And I've gone through this. I kind of, uh, one of the big busy times of the year on my blog is Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. It just kind of ended up that kind of became a a Thanksgiving expert, partially because we've been cooking it every year for like 30 years for Mm -hmm. the family. So I get a lot of traffic. I have a lot of posts about Thanksgiving, but the big deal was how do you make a turkey that comes out cooked properly all the way around? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there's, it's not just the thermometer. But it absolutely is a thermometer. You have to get to know your oven. You have to know what temperature yields you the right temperature when it's done resting. Because the way it works in our kitchen, that turkey comes out, then we have to finish all the stuff. We make gravy right mm-hmm. then and there fresh. You know, we love we love the gravy. And then you got to put all your sides in, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, point being, that's really, like, that's the key. Like, you have to know you know, what temperature to take it out at. If you, so many people I've talked to over the years will say, well, it's supposed to be, what is it? 165 yeah. on the breast meat, right? So people take it out at 165 and then they leave it on their counters for like a half an hour to an hour while they're, it's resting and they're doing the other stuff. And then they wonder why their breast meat is dry. Well, because you to take it out before it gets to 165. Mm-hmm. 
And um, with the turkey, I mean, this is, so my parents catered tons of turkey dinners and we were there for so much of it. With turkey, it stays hot for so long. It's so big, right? It's big and it holds that heat in. The temperature can rise by an insane amount after, like, like for a steak, you're going to get maybe, you know, five, five degrees or something up um, from resting. But you rest that turkey for half an hour and it can go up 10 degrees. Like, yes. it really yes. can. And then, you know, yes. you take it at 165. Now you're eating a 175 <laughs> degree turkey. Yes, totally. And and I mean, we have done, like, I have all my notes on. I'm kind of a cook by the seat of my pants kind of person day to day. Like, what's in the fridge? What do I need to use up? What do I have enough energy to do? That's, I don't really have like a full week planned out. I don't cook like that anymore. But when it comes to holidays and I have 10, 20 people coming over, I have lists and, you know, I have like calendar. So, by the way, if you're like that, you can come to my blog. I have like a two week Thanksgiving calendar you can download. What? And then I dry brine, which is another key to it, not to get onto the turkey thing. But, anyways, point being, <laughs> I'm super organized about it and I keep notes every year and I, I have like, I can look back through the calendars. What temperature did we take it out this year? Was it 155? Was it 151? What temperature did we cook it at? How long did we cook it at the high heat? Like I've been doing this year after year after year after year until we could finally say, you know, like I always say, you have to get to know your own oven, Mm -hmm. but in my oven, this is when I take it out. This is where it ends up at the end. And it works. I mean, it absolutely oh, yeah. works. Yeah, yeah. People it, it really love works. our turkey mm. between the getting the temperature right and we dry brine, which bringing me back to the flank steak and ask me more questions. But this is not something you need to plan for. But a thermometer is not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Checking the ther- checking the temperature is great, but this is so easy, and you will just love that resulting flavor is just just delicious. So I only have one question left. I think I want to know how much pomegranate molasses are you putting on there, and importantly, I mean the the flavor part of it. You said it kind of make turns into almost a sauce. But also, I'm curious about whether it's dissolving that crust at all, or do you, it doesn't matter because it's so good. Like, you know what I mean? Like, if I go and put a ton yeah. on versus a little bit, and then how much do you need to make that sauce? And are you doing mm-hmm. a bit of a trade off, or is the crust still delicious? You know, does it probably a little tiny bit dissolve the crust? I can't say that it doesn't. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, I honestly, I've never had anyone not love this. And I don't use that much pomegranate molasses. So the recipe that's on my blog calls for one to two tablespoons, a little loosey goosey, like you could almost not measure, just take a, you know, your bottle, if it's in a bottle, drizzle a little Mm bit, Mm -hmm. or you can measure, I give you a measurement because some people want that. Mm -hmm. And also, like I call for a one pound flank steak, but what if it's one and a half pounds? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Or you are a great like you want more sauce so it's one of those recipes that you know like it's not going to be bad or good because you went with two tablespoons instead of one could it dissolve the crust a little bit I've never even thought about that before maybe but the trade-off of the flavor so good and one little tip if you happen to have a cutting board that has like a little ridge around it Mm -hmm. so you don't lose the juice I recommend that that's, that's exactly right. what I was going to ask. You put it on that cutting board, you drizzle it with the pomegranate molasses, you tent it with some foil to, that's what you said, right, to stay warm for a bit. Then you're going to go and slice it against the grain. The juices are coming out. You transfer the meat to your serving platter. Do you then tip the cutting board with the juices over the meat? Is that is that the... I, I would. Yeah. I mean, that's what I would do. And, and I am crossing over recipes here, but I have this other recipe on my blog. It's super old and the pictures are super ugly, but it's this Italian steak salad. Um, I think oh. they call it like tagliata or something like that in traditionally. And not, excuse my my pronunciation. I don't have good Italian language proficiency. But anyway, the point of it is you take this steak and you lay it on top of arugula or some kind of green and it kind of becomes a steak salad and you shave some Parmesan on and you can get fancier with it, but that's the the net net of it. And just as I'm thinking about this, 
talking to you and you asking me these questions, you could totally cross over those two recipes and you could have this platter ready and you could have a bed of greens on it. You could go with like spicy arugula or more like spinach or a mixture of, or, you know, depending on how great your farmer's market is, you know, they have all these great farm. Some of these farmers have these amazing greens, but make this bed of greens and you could almost, you could lay the steak on top and you could pour the juice on and you basically could be making almost like a, just your, like your whole presentation. And it could almost be like the dressing for the greens. Mm-hmm. I'm just making this up as yeah. I talk to you, but that's kind of the way it is. Or, you know, in our family, we're a very multicultural family, very mixture of backgrounds. My husband is American, but he's Korean American. His family is from Hawaii. So we eat a lot of rice in our house. So again, like mm-hmm. imagine this sauce going on the rice or on some potatoes yes. or whatever other vegetable. It just it just kind of the yumminess, just you can really Salt. extend that flavor. Salty, meaty, sweet, syrupy. It sounds amazing, Beth. I cannot wait to try this. Can you remind everybody where they can find you if they have questions, they want to see what you're doing, if they want to stay tuned to hear the cookbook announcement that we know is probably coming soon? Where should they be? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they can find me on my blog, omgyummy.com. I refer to it as oh my god, yummy, but omgyummy.com. I'm on Instagram at omgyummy. I'm on Facebook at OMG Yummy, but also the Tasting Jerusalem group. And I, and if people like to watch videos, there's a platform that people are just getting to know called Kitch, K-I-T-T-C-H. And I do have a channel on there with, I don't know, 20, 30 or more videos of various things if they want to watch me cooking things in my kitchen. And then I'm just starting to dabble in TikTok and I'm OMG yummy 20 there, but dabbling. So if you really want the rich experience, come and find me on my blog, on Instagram, OMG yummy or on Facebook, OMG yummy. And the essential Jewish baking cookbook they can find. Yes. They can find that they can go to the cookbook page on my blog and then click through and it'll take you through to Amazon to buy it. Or you can just go straight to Amazon. And I want do want to mention quickly, it's a great book to give as a gift for any Jewish holiday. And it's available, which is a different kind of thing. But my publisher wanted to make it available. Originally, it was paperback, but it's also available in hardcover. And it's really lovely as a hardcover. It stays open beautifully on the counter. And as a gift, it's a really wonderful thing. So um, keep that in mind. You can look for it and you can buy it in paperback or hardcover. Thank you so much for being on the show and sharing this recipe with us. You're, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me again. I love talking with you and I hope I get a chance to come back and share some more recipes with you. Oh, oh yeah. When the cookbook comes out, the next one, we'll talk again for sure. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Christine. Okay, so I totally made Beth's recipe right after she told me about it that night. And I cannot tell you how incredible it was. It was just me and Marty here and I made it and I wasn't really sure what to expect. I understood that the flavors were going to be great, but you know, Beth said that you pour the syrup on there and then it turns into like a gravy. I didn't really understand how that was going to happen, but it totally happened. It basically mixes with the meat juices on the top and drizzles them down and makes this like brown sauce. And we sliced the steak and like she was saying, we actually put it on some arugula leaves with some tomatoes. I didn't love the tomatoes with it, actually. There was cucumber on there. That was much better. I think red onion, maybe even some feta cheese would have been wonderful. And like some pomegranate arils on there too would have been good. But the meat itself with the pomegranate molasses was delicious and you have to try it. I will put the link to the recipe in the show notes for this podcast episode or head over to omgyummy.com and you will find it there. Bethley is so great. You're going to love her recipes. Don't forget to check out that cookbook too. I'll put the link in the show notes for this podcast episode or go to Amazon or wherever you're looking for cookbooks and search for Bethley Cookbook or The Essential Jewish Baking Cookbook. You will find it and you will love it.
Okay, so now is when I usually tell you what is happening in my kitchen this week, but there is nothing happening in my kitchen this week because I am in Italy and I can't tell you about the food that I'm having because I've pre-recorded this. So I do not have anything to tell you about what is happening in my kitchen, but I can tell you what's happening on my websites and on this show in the week ahead. So on Cook the Story, we have a recipe for classic taco dip going up. You know this one. I am obsessed with this recipe. My mom used to make it when I was little and she would take it to like potlucks and things. I would always just sit at the table where this dip was and eat. I would just go taco chip after taco chip eating this dip. It's the one that's like sour cream and cream cheese and taco seasoning on the bottom and then cheese, shredded lettuce, tomato, black olives, green onion on top. So good. That is finally going on Cook the Story. I make it all the time and I just had never photographed it or written it up. So now that is there for you or this week it's going up for you. And then on the cookful this week, I have a recipe that I hinted at a while ago. I told you that I was making mashed potatoes when my friend Ed was over for dinner and that we sat down to have these meatball appetizers while the potatoes were on the stove and I forgot about the potatoes on the stove and they like way over boiled. Do you remember that story? Well, that was the day after I had tested these air fryer turkey meatballs and the meatballs we were having were these air fryer turkey meatballs, but we tossed them in tomato sauce and put some like mozzarella cheese on them. Super, super good. That air fryer turkey meatball recipe, which I swear by, so, so good. Those are going up on the cookful this week. So stay tuned for that. And as to what is happening on this show, you're going to get a new recipe idea every single day of the week, seven days a week, two on Saturdays, like today. I told you about the pork butt roast this morning, and then Beth told us about this wonderful pomegranate molasses on the flank steak. Amazing. So what you have to look forward to coming up, the boneless turkey breast roast recipe that I'm telling you about tomorrow is like game changing. This is turkey breast like I've never had it before. So delicious. I would make this for Thanksgiving, like make two or three of them and just have this. Even though I am a dark turkey meat lover, I don't usually like the breast meat. I'm all about this. It is some of the best turkey I've ever made, ever had. So good. I'll be telling you more about that tomorrow. We're doing some air fryer stuffed peppers this week. We're poaching chicken. There's a really nice Mexican skillet dinner. And oh, I'll be telling you more about that taco dip. Of course I am. So that is what you can look forward to this week on this show. If you are subscribed, all of those will show up in your podcast feed. If you're not already subscribed, it's very easy to do. Wherever you listen to podcasts on your phone, go to that place on your phone and search for recipe of the day and then hit subscribe or follow. That is one way to do it. The other way to do it is to go to cookthestory.com slash ROTD and then you'll see the buttons along the top for Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, those sorts of things, whichever one is the one you use, click on it and it takes you right to the show. So that is the easiest way to subscribe and then you will see all of these every day, twice on Saturday, coming your way. I'm Christine Pittman from cookthestory.com, thecookful.com, the all new chicken cookbook and from this podcast recipe of the day. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Let's get cooking.